whole thing is yes, of course, the answer is yes, because the trial showed exactly yeah. that. Even if you are very stable uh, on an ACE inhibitor or an ERB, you should, should be shifted should to ERB. Shift. So there's no question about that. Again, of course, we've discussed this very often that there's nothing like a stable heart failure. You know, the patient may say patient feels well, they often uh, stop exercising and they say, oh, we are not breathless because many they're not doing much work. And of course, they still have incidents of sudden death and other options, other possibilities of uh, uh, severe cardiac complications. So the answer is yes, any patient who's so-called stable on ARB or AC inhibitor should be shifted to ARNI. That's a tricky one because uh, uh, most of us, of course, the signs and symptoms of heart failure would uh, uh, would be the uh, way in which the patient would present uh, uh, to us. But uh, I, I guess uh, apart from uh, using the the natriuretic peptides uh, that uh, that as a blood test for screening, uh, we should have uh, to be more uh, accurate in our diagnosis. Uh, we would require uh, at least an echo and. Uh, 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 as Professor Coates mentioned, there is a waiting list uh, uh, in all other centers. Fortunately, as Dr. Dalal mentioned, we, in, in India, it's pretty easy to get an echo and at least a basic echo to find out what you're dealing with. And that's the way forward. I think clinical examination is still important. I think uh, di after all, we, the diagnosis of heart failure is a clinical diagnosis. The heart failure diagnosis is not really a echocardiographic diagnosis or of CT or a MRI diagnosis. I think examination and Dr. Coates will agree with that. I mean, I'm sure he's diagnosed thousands of patients just clinically on basis of clinical findings that this patient has heart failure. What do you think, Dr. Coates? Do we need all this? I, I know echo is important. I'm not underplaying anything, but I think clinical examination will give us a vast amount of information. I mean, look, anyone experienced, and I'm sure many of the people on this webinar would be very talented and able to make a diagnosis of HEPPEF reliably clinically, because there are signs, there are definite signs there. Um, but the trouble is that if we're recommending it to doctors who perhaps don't have that experience and training, there will be errors. So I think it's a strong recommendation to say you really do need an echo, you should have an echo. Having said that, I wouldn't wait and I'd be confident making diagnosis. And I know many of my colleagues would be confident, but I'd still like to see an echo at some stage. But again, as Dr. Bhagirath mentioned, we should be careful about echoes as well, because sometimes what happens, people are not experienced. You do an echo, the usual echo report comes, ejection fraction is 60%. And the patient and the doctor says, oh, this is not heart failure, thinking the ejection fraction yeah, is normal. Yeah. Many of our echo centers, though we can do it in a matter of hours, do not give us all the information about strains and diastolic function, etc. So we get a very basic echo majority of times concentrating on ejection fraction. So we need to be careful of that. Especially those that are done uh, in screening camps. So yeah. they focus on uh, the ejection fraction only sure. because you, you have uh, multiple patients and you need to uh, you need to do a quick echo. So uh, the focus is on uh, just getting the ejection fraction numbers and uh, a detailed echo is uh, often not done uh, in in uh, mass screening uh, programs. How often does uh, Dr. Bhagirath and Dr. Kos, how often do you do exercise echo for picking up uh, a preserved ejection fraction? Is that something which you do commonly, Dr. Kos? Um, I wouldn't say commonly. I mean, I do it a lot for clinical trials. I do it for cases that where there's uncertainty and I'll do it for evaluation of, of the specific etiology. So yes, I do it, but it's a particular interest of our unit. I, I don't think it's so common across the country. Dr. Bhagirath, in your center, yes. exercise echo is a common, as a reasonably often done? No, uh, it's as uh, Professor Coates mentioned, we, we do it as part of clinical trials and investigations that uh, uh, where specifically it is required, but not uh, not on a routine basis, uh, not on a day-to-day -day basis, basis. But again, I must emphasize what uh, Professor Coates mentioned that uh, uh, when you follow up these patients, a CPET and a six-minute walk test are really handy to uh, to see the how the patient has improved with the treatment. Because, uh, uh, as you pointed rightly pointed out, sir, many times the patient doesn't exercise enough, and you would say he's quite okay in terms of symptoms. So we need quantification. We need numbers. So I think uh, this must be done more regularly. Uh, yeah, for, I think for the patient. Cardiologists, cardiologists somehow in India at least don't do six-minute tests as often as it should be. I see a lot of pulmonologists, yes. people who are treating hypertension, do a lot of six-minute walk. 
But somehow cardiologists yes. don't get into that six minute for some reason in India, and I think we need to improve that. Fortunately for us, we work as a team, so that that's always there on the protocol. ideal case because you know it's a very effective antihypertensive agent um, it works in in abnormal ventricular function you know over the wide range of ejection fractions so that sounds a good case the the only limitation for Arnie sometimes is patients with very low blood pressure so it's a good thing when the blood pressure is higher because there you really know you've got almost a double benefit and a double indication just to mention of course Arnie was initially used for hypertension and I think the cost prohibits it being from use for treatment for hypertension per se. But now we have generic RNA. We've got, I think, 10, 12 companies now making RNA and the cost has dramatically come down. So I think any patient with severe hypertension and some evidence, either clinical or otherwise, of heart failure, diastolic or systolic, and not necessarily very low ejection fractions, I think it would be a good idea to use RNA if the cost is not an issue now with it coming down, rather than an ARB or an AC inhibitor, particularly against an ARB. I think RNA would be a better choice for a hypertensive patient for both treatment of hypertension and for that marginal benefit in these so so-called mid-range or upper mid-range ejection fractions. Dr. Bagira, do you have? Yes, totally agree with that, sir. Totally agree with that. Yeah, you have uh, you have a double benefit with uh, one drug, so I think uh, uh, definitely would agree uh, to its usage in in this kind of in this context. Thirty-six hour washout. Uh, you need to stop the ACE inhibitors. Wait for thirty-six hours and then initiate ARNI. Whereas, uh, if you are using ARB, you can switch uh, uh, immediately to ARNI. This is a guideline recommendation uh, for the switching. Doctor Coach, do you actually religiously follow that? Is it practically important? I know we all follow that, but sometimes it confuses the patient. They don't start the second drug. So, I mean, do you think it's a big? Practical clinical problem using uh, Arnie say the next day after stopping AC uh, uh, inhibitors. Yeah, I mean, I'm sure you get away with it. I mean, the recommendation is doing that, but yeah, I, I accept there is a risk if you tell a patient you can't take for a, a day and a half. The risk is they won't restart. Um, mm -hmm. So that's why I think really the the ultimate solution is to start the Arnie from the beginning. Then you get away with all those problems. <laughs> If you have a patient with heart failure with reduced ejection fraction, we have been saying this again and again, do not do sequentially. That means if your patient's on SGLT2, you should actually question why the patient was not on RNA. I think that's important of checklist. You have a patient in the OPD, he comes from another hospital, he's on SGLT2 but not on RNA. So really, you need to know why he wasn't on RNA. There may be a genuine reason. His creatinine may have shot up. His blood pressure may have been 90 systolic when he left the hospital. And therefore, there's a genuine reason. So now you have a reason for a patient not being on RNA. Now you have to look at it. Maybe his creatinine has come down. His potassium has come down. His blood pressure has crept up again. And that's a good time to add RNA. Or sometimes people just forget to add RNA or are scared of using RNA. So there are many reasons. So I think we need to find out why. And of course, if there is no contraindication, to immediately start RNA. Not only Arnie, but also to start the other fillers, which are the uh, MRI uh, and the beta blockers. So not just look at Arnie, but look at all the four pillars and make sure that all four pillars are started, even if necessary, in small doses. So it's not necessary to optimize a dose of each drug and then move on to the second drug. Start small doses of all the drugs, because once the patient is on a drug, even if it's a small dose, it's much easier to increase the dose in the outpatient rather than to add a new drug. So we tend to use all four drugs in the patient when the patient leaves the hospital, however small the doses may be, and then see them early in the OPD within maybe next uh, 10 to 15 days, and then quickly step up the drugs as much as possible. One is the patient comes with heart failure, you put him on diuretics, uh, and uh, his blood pressure is 90 systolic. He feels a little dizzy every time he stands up. His creatinine is 2.5 and his potassium is 5.8. I mean, that's the practical problem. I mean, do you start RNA at that point? Patient's not on RNA. SGLT2 is easier to start because they don't have that much effect on the blood pressure and they produce more uh, uh, beneficial effect. The patient is still wet. 
the first thing to do is to make sure that your diuretic dose is reduced down because sometimes too much diuretics which we give early when we treat acute heart failure that doesn't need to be carried on simply reducing the dose of diuretics the blood pressure may come up the creatinine may start falling down at that point in time when you feel the patient is reasonably uh, stable enough to take the drug you start and we start in very small doses i know that the guidelines don't recommend but we start something like 25 mg twice a day of arni instead of 50 twice a day and i think quite happy with starting 25 judging the patient's response and then stepping it up but there will be occasional patients in whom we simply cannot give arni because the blood pressure keeps dropping to 80 they cannot tolerate at all creatinine shoots up potassium shoots up i know we got potassium binders which you can use now to control potassium but i still feel there'll be a small subset of patients in whom arni is really very difficult to start even in small doses sglt2 are easier beta blockers of course you can always use as long as the patient is not severely bradycardic or has some bradyarrhythmia again small doses of beta blockers are quite useful so i think i agree with you there are practical difficulties and which is why i think verisigvat is becoming more popular in india because it doesn't have those problems so even if the patient's blood pressure is 80 and the creatinine is 2 you can still use verisigvat without running into trouble so therefore these are the options and practical problems so basically an echo would help you to differentiate and whenever there's pulmonary hypertension there's always an additional work up that's required do we go ahead I, in in our center we go up with a protocol wherein uh, a ct pulmonary angio is done uh, and uh, and we would like to know what is the real etiology uh, for this pulmonary hypertension so uh, i think uh, if you uh, if you progress in terms of the work up it's pretty clear whether you're dealing with uh, a heart failure scenario or a pulmonary hypertension scenario uh, of course uh, in in selected cases we would also like to do a right heart study to see uh, where exactly we stand in in this particular profile and then of course uh, uh, the treatment would be tailored according to uh, uh, the context of the patient my my views are is that you don't need any big hospital to have a heart yes. failure clinic i think the heart failure clinic should be in your head any individual can have a known heart failure clinic in terms of what is basically the importance of heart failure clinic the importance of heart failure clinic is that you shouldn't miss a diagnosis you make an early diagnosis and you should give guideline treatment so that doesn't need a big hospital we don't need mris for all these patients we don't need any sophisticated investigations you examine the patient maybe do an nt pro bnp if patient can afford it to an echo which i think most people be able to do and all you have to do is to make sure that the patient gets correct treatment so if we do that i think that's sufficient even in the smallest of place so even a small doctor in a small setup in a small village can do good treatment for heart failure if he has the knowledge and the lack and then the ability to do it without having the physician's inertia then of course as you get up with that the thing you can go better and better and as dr coach said dr bagira tha big heart failure clinics with heart failure nurses and continuous monitoring all that is possible so heart failure clinic starts from very base one doctor one patient to one uh, simple ecg and 2d echo to an extensive investigation including heart transplant dr bagira so, yes <laughs> so so i'll i'll make a start by saying that you need a person who can identify heart failure that's all that you require to start a heart failure clinic it uh, doesn't even have to be a doctor if you're looking at a very remote place it can be a nurse practitioner uh, uh, and of course a general practitioner as well so uh, it's it's like a spoken hub so once you have a person who can identify heart failure uh, then gradually the numbers will come up and then you you'll have more and more uh, people who Uh, who will man particular uh, uh, parts of the heart failure clinic and then comes in the equipment and then the expansion so it all starts off with one committed individual who can identify heart failure the rest of, of it can be built around that person yeah just educate yourself and have a simple chart ch checklist of the drugs that the patient should have and other things that uh, need to be done all you need to do is monitor pulse blood pressure and weight that's all very basic simple things you can have your own heart failure clinic so people who are in small places do not get worried that you need some big setups for heart failure clinics dr coach what do you feel you are of course in the biggest center for heart failure clinic so what do you think of the small people in the small place yeah i totally agree with what you said a heart failure clinic is that passion and that knowledge to manage heart failure well um it's identifying that this is the most serious condition this patient's likely to have 
and you need to put the effort into making an accurate diagnosis and giving the right treatment. It's a frame of mind and use whatever resources you have.